Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to Comic Vault. It's me, Captain Logan, and joining me tonight is Austin, the Day Ghost. Greetings, Austin. Thanks for joining me for an extra show on a Monday, sir. Yeah, what 80s sitcom did you get that music from? <laughs> oh, that was uh, Starlight Zone from uh, Sonic 1. Okay, I figured it was a Sonic thing, but I was just waiting for uh, lyrics to pop up. And I could just like see the family sitcom, like, you know, they do it, they turn, and you get like the name. As soon as you said that, I was going to say we should have opened the show just each, like, you know, it cuts to a close-up of each of our heads, and we just go. <laughs> and then it's like, uh, Austin the Day Ghost. Yeah, exactly. And we could keep going, like, uh, the Too Many Cooks video. Uh, usually on a Monday night, I do Superhero Rewind Unscripted, and I had uh, kind of a weird weekend. Uh, my whole family was sick, and I got pushed back a couple of days. And Austin and I had been trying to figure out a place to sneak this in, and I thought, uh, well, I, I don't have time to write a bunch of notes for a movie, but maybe I can get this uh, book read. And uh, I had to cram this a little bit. I wish I had time to read it a second time. I did try to thumb through it again uh, after I read it, just in case uh, there was anything I missed or to kind of refresh myself on some things, but uh, this is going to be a real kind of reactionary, I just read it, here is how, how I feel about it uh, kind of discussion, and maybe Austin's had a little bit more time to think about it than I have uh, and can and can bring quite a bit to the table, because uh, Austin and I were both starting this a few days ago, and I only got through like the first issue and then read the rest of it today. Uh, Austin, had, had you finished it already, or did you have to work on it today as well? Yeah, so I had four issue. I think it was a four, maybe five issues left. Yeah, I think five issues uh, left yesterday, and um, I was like, oh, I'll probably read maybe three and then read two during the day today. And I ended up blowing through all five last night. So I've had all day to think about the book as a whole. Yeah, uh, so this is uh, Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, obviously the main reason that we're tackling this, and I'm sure there's lots of other channels doing this right now also, uh, is because, pardon me, is because I, I got a, I got a, thro a frog in my throat or something, <laughs> I got kryptonite in my throat, I... Uh, so, obviously, this story was uh, chosen to be one of the new movies uh, to, to be adapted for the new slate of DC movies. Uh, it was one of the last things in the list that was announced uh, by James Gunn last week. And one of the big things I said I want to be excited about, but I haven't read this book yet, so I kind of wanted to rush and take a look at it and see why a, a thing that's so recent is uh, in the slate, because that seems like kind of a surprising choice. And... Uh, I don't know about you, Austin. I don't know that Supergirl herself was all that surprising of a choice, given that. Well, maybe uh, because like like she's supposed to be. Uh, she was supposed to be in something. Is it Flash? Is she in she's Flash? It, she's in Flash. Yeah, okay, and then suddenly we're Flash. gonna have a different version of that character, probably. <laughs> Most that's it. Likely. So I guess it is a little bit surprising that that's what they went to. So I uh, I'm not surprised. I think it's really interesting, and I haven't gotten to talk about this later on the channel. But I think it's really interesting that uh, four out of the five things that he picked for movies are like the first four DC movies, that being Superman, Batman, Swamp Thing, and Supergirl. I think that's really weird. You think that, that's on uh, purpose? I I don't think so, but I think it's weird that it turned out that way. Yeah, that's weird. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, but I didn't think Supergirl That's was true. a weird choice because I assumed that Gunn would kind of take advantage of stuff that's like, you know, kind of out there right now. Like, I'll be shocked if we don't get a Teen Titans thing because people know that. I'll be shocked if we don't get Green Arrow real quick because of Arrow. Yeah. Well, uh, I thought Green Arrow was going to be in that first slate. No, so did I. Um, and Supergirl just had a big show. Uh, so I wasn't too shocked that they announced a movie for her. Maybe... A little shocked that it's their third movie, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, I just wasn't sure you'd get two of of, of uh, technically any property in the first slate. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I'll be surprised Absolutely. if Supergirl's not set up in the Superman movie. No, same here. I'll be shocked if both her and Crypto aren't in that movie. Of course, I don't want to spend the whole time just talking about the slate again and uh, upcoming movies and such, uh, but I, I, I'd I, be remiss in not bringing it up at, at the beginning of the show because, again, that's part of the reason that we're talking about this tonight, or the main reason we're talking about this. And also, uh, I kind of wanted to open this just uh, kind of throwing out uh, if we're more or less excited about that project now that we've read this, uh, and I'm going to throw out a resounding yes. 
uh, I think this makes uh, plenty of sense to be adapted into uh, its own film, a standalone thing. It doesn't feel like too, mat- too much material to put in one movie. It's, it's wonderfully standalone. It's a really good introduction, I think, to this character. If you don't know anything about Cara Zarell, I think it's a really good update, uh, as much as it is updated, because it doesn't even really feel that updated, uh, which is one of the things I really like about it. Uh, it takes a lot of the characterization that I liked a lot from New 52 Supergirl, which uh, I, I always tout up as my favorite version of that character, and this feels like her just uh, matured quite a bit. Um, I, I don't want to say, like, mellowed out, because, like, she still swears all the time. I think she kind of did that in that book, and uh, she's got all this rage that she is, uh, like, like bottling up. Uh, we, we talk a lot in this book about... Uh, how much restraint she has to uh, show because unlike uh, Superman, she was actually there for the destruction of Krypton, which we actually get to see from her perspective and it's kind of, in some ways, more grueling than I've seen it before, which is one of the things I really like about this book. So all of that will be really nice to throw up in a movie and to contrast uh, with Superman's perspective. And maybe, Austin, that's part of the reason that uh, he thought to put that in the first round of movies movies so you can get that immediate parallel and contrast between those two characters Mm -hmm. yeah no that's that's really interesting um i i'd imagine that that's probably part of it uh so what was your main takeaway from this like and and we'll get into the ins and outs of it here in a minute but are are you i are you like more excited about this as a choice after having read this so i think this was honestly probably the thing in the slate that i was the most hesitant about uh, just because I I really really don't like Tom King's Batman. I like his vision. I have ish- I have some issues with it, but I like his. We vision talked about overall. that for a couple hours. We, yeah, we really exactly. enjoyed that overall. Yeah. No, exactly. Um, but just because of his Batman, I was I was very concerned about it. And then reading it almost immediately, I was like, okay, no, I I can tell why they picked this. Like the, this is a movie. <laughs> Yeah, and this is the kind of thing that I've been begging for for years, right, is go to, uh, like, like shorter, standalone miniseries that could just be graphic novel releases in the first place. We've done a lot of that with DC Direct-to-Video animated movies, uh, but not nearly enough in live action for anything that wasn't just a standalone book in the first place. We we rarely do this for superheroes, right? Like, I, Days of Future Past sort of did it. That was one of the things that I was excited about with that movie, where it's like, oh good, you picked a story and you called it that, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, it's a thing that superhero movies don't do enough. We cherry-pick, we blend a lot of things batman movies can't stop being a mix of long halloween and something else uh you know we do we we go back to year one all the time uh but like why don't you just do the say long halloween as a movie or i uh, i don't know first thing that comes to mind do a christmas thing batman noel as a movie like, yeah like there's all there's all kinds of different things uh that that you could do and the blueprint is right there you know we talk all the time about how comics are storyboards where you could more or less just take it right off the page and make a movie and i uh, there's a bunch of stuff obviously before this I uh, that I would like to see, but I don't know that I've read another Supergirl story that's like this self-contained. You know what this reminded me a lot of, and I think uh, a lot of people have have talked about this as a good blueprint for a, a Superman movie. Although we did an animated version and it, we had to truncate it, and it wasn't the best thing. This reminded me a lot of All Star Superman, just in oh, okay, structure. Yeah. Uh, Which is interesting because that's the big thing that he's looking at for Superman, at least in tone. Uh, he said. Uh, I hadn't heard that, but that doesn't surprise me. Uh, th- this is a good companion piece to that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And it's, I haven't. It's read not the same thing. Decade, don't get but... me wrong. What were you saying? Sorry. The, when I haven't read that in a decade, but um, they're both very like quintessential stories for the character that you can easily just like pick up and read. Well, and what reminded me of All Star structurally is it's it's one story beginning to, to end, and it's tightly plotted enough, I think this is even maybe more tightly plotted than All-Star is, uh, because All-Star kind of, in a few places, goes off the beaten path a little bit and isn't necessarily setting up and paying off anything, uh, but everything, at least, like, character-wise and world-building-wise is important, but this is broken up into eight episodes in the same way that 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 is in, what was that, 12? 
however many issues all star so, is. Yeah. It's it's been too long. Uh but it but it did it did remind me quite a bit of that. And also in telling a pretty serious and sometimes uh, kind of dark story that's got a lot of whimsy to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It goes back to all to a lot of the uh, you know fun, silly, silver, golden age stuff. Uh, you can just have you know uh, Crypto the Super Dog and Comet the Super Horse both in the same book, and it's never silly. Yeah, no, it just it it takes itself seriously, and like it's you know uh, comedic in the sense that you go, "That's a super horse." Yeah, but it never stops, and you know. Uh, makes a joke about it. It's not like Tom King's uh, Kite Man, where it's just like constant, like, yeah, it's Kite Man, get it? <laughs> uh, so since you had reservations about Tom King, uh, talk a little bit about your first impressions of the writing here compared to uh, stuff that you've liked and stuff that you haven't. Because I think some of his hallmarks are certainly here. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. And I'll uh, say some of the things I don't like about Tom King's writing is still here. Uh, like, like one of one of my only uh, major complaints about this is is in the writing. But uh, anyway, how did it stack up for you? Um, it reminded me of uh, Vision, I guess, and just in the sense that his writing didn't really bother me. I thought it was really good. And uh, I agree, there's definitely stuff from his Batman that annoyed me there uh, that doesn't really annoy me here. Like, I feel like it's, there's certain things that he does in both that I think is done better here. Um, like there's examples of like repetition and stuff that I think is handled a lot better than uh, it is in Batman. Well, and it's subtle and it's not in your face and you wouldn't mm-hmm. even really think of it as repetition so much as set up and payoff. Like if, yeah, if you're talking no, about the too. thing that you mentioned to me privately, I wouldn't even call that uh, like, like repetition as a device so much as just mm-hmm. – well, I guess kind of. I because I you were talking about the thing in what the second issue with the yeah, that's the big example with like yeah. the alien that's that's uh, falling asleep on her shoulder in a spaceship, and then there's one later where once she's got her powers back, I uh, she can just like break his nose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's the exact same scene except it's just uh, slightly different. Where in one of them the alien goes like, oh, "Okay, I'll, I'll I'll leave you alone," and then in the other. He doesn't, and Supergirl just punches him in the back of the head. Yeah, he's not doing the repeated line thing, and he's not getting cutesy about it like he did with the no, whole that's bat true, cat too. thing and the I'm going to yeah. break your damn back thing. And the, I mean, na- name them. Like, they're like, there's a million of yeah. them. And the, 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 uh, kite, man the kite man out. thing. Yeah, the, the hell yeah thing. Well, that's another thing is, uh, especially in his Batman, like I think Tom King puts in a lot of jokes in his writing that I don't typically find funny. But I do think this book is genuinely pretty funny in places. And natural levity. Exactly. He's exactly. not forcing any of that stuff in. He's not He's not like, oh, we need a joke here. Uh, it's no, a little... I think his Batman has that, where like it feels like the MCU, like, now you get to be it. Yeah, it, in some places it absolutely does. And then at the point where it goes off the rails, I can't take any of it seriously anymore. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Tom King is a, and, and this is going to sound harsh for fans of his, but I'm just calling it like I'm seeing it. He's got a real Jekyll and Hyde thing going on. I uh, like he, mm-hmm. his bad stuff is really bad. And I, and I'm starting to think because he can be a master storyteller. That's so, and don't get me wrong. There are lots of good writers that have missteps. Uh, yeah, that have sto- like Morris, not everything Morrison writes is gold. Not everything Alan Moore writes is gold. I uh, like maybe, maybe more so than some other people, but like, I, uh, you know, everybody's got those things that, that uh, they had to kind of rush out over a weekend or that their heart wasn't really in or where they were just having, you know, an, an off day, like whatever your, your uh, job is, even if it's our, even if it's, you know, doing art, very few of us are going to be amazing every single time. But I have not seen the disparity that I see with Tom King, uh, between worst thing ever. And I uh, like, like top 20 DC books in the last, 15 years like like I, I can't think of anybody else that's got the chasm that he does for me that I've read and keep in mind that I'm rusty and I'm I'm a little out of touch with new and uh, I haven't read anything around this in a long time people are bringing up a lot of uh, newer like standalone stories like this out of either out of continuity or otherwise that I still haven't looked at and, and don't know about so uh, my camera is <laughs> rising the camera rises <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah. 
Yeah, with Tom King, I think it's either uh, he just works better in like mini or maxi series than he does in ongoing, or it's just that I don't like his take on Batman, and I haven't read enough Tom King to know exactly what it is. Uh, trust me, it could be a bit of both. Yeah, and it could be a bit of both too. Yeah, no, but I'm I hear telling you, there are a lot as of much as you don't love things, the but... the earlier stuff in that run. There's there's no way you would even think the same person was writing it by the end. Like it's it's shocking how far that goes off the rails in my mind. When well, uh, you've got farther in that than I have, I finished like, it quite a bit. Yeah, uh, I didn't get to the wedding. <laughs> I like I was out before that. Yeah, and then the, the uh, and, and I don't mean just go down his whole uh, I you know discography as it were, but I. Uh, his the the Batman Cowman black label thing was one of the worst things I've ever read. I mean, it was that was terrible. Uh, but then of course he's got uh, he he's got all these gems uh, that that people talk about, like Mister Miracle, which I've not finished but liked what I read of. Uh, so anyway, like uh, Snyder, uh, my computer completely froze on me and I couldn't do anything whatsoever. I have no idea why we were having no technical problems whatsoever before that. Uh, but we're going to try to continue here and, uh, more, more folks are popping in. So they, they must be able to see us now. Uh, yeah, I ended up playing on my phone and it did just start. So I think we're fine. Okay, cool. Exciting. Uh, so I just restarted everything. And if you're watching this after the fact, uh, it probably just jumped right to me saying we were having a problem and you didn't even know it. Uh, so we're going to try to jump back in to wherever we were. Where were we, Austin? What uh, were we talking, talking about, about? You are talking about Snyder Batman and something about how that related to Tom King. Oh, oh, oh. I think I was just saying that I, he he has the same problem to me sometimes uh, in being kind of hit or miss, but even he doesn't have that chasm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but Snyder's King Batman is on, he's is really on. Of, is more like bland when it gets bad. Yeah, at least the stuff I've read because I've not finished his run. But uh, I mean, and then when he gets to Gordon Batman with the big rabbit ears, it's a little bit confounding. But like, it's not horribly yeah. written or anything. Well, there, and I never got there, so there's too much of that analysis on the page thing that both of those guys do. Yeah, but other than that, I don't know what, what it feels to me like with Tom King when he's not very good, or 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 when he's when he's truly awful. In my humble opinion, it's almost like he's doing it on purpose. And I and I don't know why. It's almost like he's trolling somebody, like like a, like editorial or something. Because it the writing. Because I know he's better than that, right? And so the writing yeah, feels totally. a little bit like 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 I don't mean to, to be disparaging to the man. He he's a good writer. He knows what he's doing, and that's why that's confusing to me. <laughs> uh, it reads a little bit like when Peter David has sometimes been pissed off with the publisher with Star Trek books. Uh, he's written a couple of intentionally terrible Star Trek books. <laughs> That's bizarre. Yeah, okay. just because of mandates he didn't like and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I wonder if there's any of those kinds of sh shenanigans going on. But we should get into the actual heart of the matter and the story here. Austin, would you give us uh, a brief synopsis of this eight-issue maxi series? Uh, and and uh, tell us what uh, Supergirl's motivation is and uh, what what's happening here. Yeah, of course. Uh, before, uh, sorry, while I'm doing that, can you also put on the screen just so I can see the uh, art you're putting on? Um, but uh, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow is about a woman named, or I guess not a woman, she's like a kid. Uh, it's about a girl named Ruth and uh, this criminal named uh, Krem of the Yellow Hills. He uh, kills her father. So she wants revenge, and uh, it becomes very true grit. Like, it's basically the plot of that. Um, and she's looking for somebody that can kill uh, her father's killer for her. And uh, she ends up running into Supergirl, who, of course, has, doesn't want anything to do with that because she's Supergirl and doesn't want to kill people. And uh, she's only on this planet because she's 21 and she wants to get drunk uh, for her birthday. And... Uh, uh, Krem ends up attacking them, and he uh, shoots both Supergirl and Crypto with arrows. Uh, so they go off on, or and he steals their ship too. And then it's basically just like a road trip thing, basically of uh, Supergirl and this girl Ruth uh, hunting down the killer. And um, you know they show up into different little uh, 
events uh, wherever they go. Yeah, trying to find the bad guy and uh, exactly, and dealing with uh, his new kind of uh, horrifying gang after they uh, commit a genocide, mm-hmm. and uh, that whole thing is terrifying. But yeah, yeah. It, it's a, it's a pretty involved story. Uh, it's got a real simple premise in the first place, but we're gallivanting all over the universe. We go to not just a bunch of different planets, but a bunch of different galaxies. This spans all over the place. Uh, you you can see other more uh, kind of thematic and uh, like genre reasons that James Gunn would be interested in this material. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, just visually, um, like with how colorful it is, it reminded me of uh, Guardians 2. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there, yeah there, there's quite a bit of Guardians here without being the same sort of absurdist, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with that. You know, uh, it's cosmic in scope, but not necessarily in ideas. Uh, like, it, it doesn't go to the the really wild, uh, like you know, break your brain kind of stuff. It's space before it's cosmic. No, absolutely. Um, Because like I said, it's basically true grit, and it's got some of that Western stuff in it. Like, uh, you kind of end with, uh, not end, but like start your climax with almost like a standoff between Ruth and uh, Krem. Yeah. uh, Where they're both kind of lined up. And you do, you have that shot where it's back off and you see both of them uh, standing there and they have a weapon in the middle. So it's not like a draw uh, situation. You know, that's, it's interesting you say that and uh, some other folks in the comments, and by the way, hi everybody uh, watching live. Um, Other folks in the comments were mentioning Westerns too, and I should have gotten that sensibility from, I guess in places I I must have without, uh, like, um, articulating that in my mind, Austin, because in some places I was getting uh, Old Man Logan vibes from this. Well, that that's definitely a thing too. Which, uh, mm-hmm. but but the main thing that that I was thinking all through this is, oh, this is real traditional Joseph Campbell stuff. Like I was going to uh, epic tradition before I was going to Western. Well, I think the big thing with Western is because the story is so similar to True Grit. Um, if you know that, you're just kind of looking at it. Yeah, for and it's it. been so long since I've seen that, I wasn't even thinking about that, but of course that is kind of a, uh, a modern archetypal story in its way that, I mean, mm-hmm. is a pretty universal kind of thing. Yeah, no, because it's definitely more of a sci-fi thing, but there is uh, just like elements of uh, Western material if you're looking for it. Yeah. Well, and I was kind of expecting this to turn into a lone wolf and cub sort of thing at some point, and then that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was kind of refreshing because that's a big thing that we go to right now. Yeah. Yeah, especially, obviously, after Mandalorian. But that was yeah. that was getting really popular even before that. Well, and even, um, you know, with uh, Old Man Logan, like, that's how we adapted it. Yep. Uh, yeah, so it is pretty refreshing that it didn't exactly go to that place. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, no, immediately I'm thinking Campbell because right at the beginning you've got uh, somebody going to your hero for help. She's resisting the call. She ultimately begrudgingly decides to go on this big epic adventure where there's going to be tons of trials and tribulations. Uh, you even have th- a whole issue where she basically has the like descent into hell or, or you know some sort of like horrible torment. Uh, and then like right at the end you kind of have the return to home thing with Ruth it's a little bit of a stretch but this is kind of a it's dual protagonist before it's just Supergirl's story right because I thought this was going to be like a <clears throat> like a Sherlock Holmes and Watson kind of thing where it's Supergirl's story but you you've got the friend that's documenting everything but it's it's her story as much as it is Supergirl's yeah absolutely um, like she has the opportunity for change uh, as well and arguably they both kind of have to go through the same arc, I guess. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, because uh, one initially... Or Supergirl thinks she is in a good place with I'm not going to kill people, and then I uh, she has a big crisis of faith and then kind of has to, in trying to teach this girl that lesson, she's got to relearn it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, it ends up being that they both kind of teach each other. 
Um, no, and from the start, I wasn't really sure if the narration box was Supergirl. Like, I assumed that's what it was initially until, like, I got a little bit further and yeah. realized, like, oh, no, this isn't, like, Supergirl's dad is killed at the beginning. Because I assumed that's where it was going, and this was going to be, like, a new origin thing for her. Yeah, it's only a couple pages in. Uh, King does a, a decent enough job of giving you a, a, a sense of who the speaker is or that it's at least not Supergirl uh, mm -hmm. pretty early on because yep. she starts referring to her uh, in the third person. And then uh, it took me an issue or the whole first issue to really get into this because I couldn't figure out setting right away. Oh, okay, yeah. So like, I didn't even realize we were on an alien planet at first, and I, I didn't I didn't know where we were and what exactly was happening, and I was trying to figure out, like, genre and tone and stuff, because he's, he's playing around with kind of uh, Middle Ages sort of language or bordering on, on like, Renaissance with, with, uh, with Ruth, with, uh, with, with the way she's speaking. Uh, it's real, like, I don't know, 14th, 15th, century European and uh, I'm like so immediately my mind is going to oh, okay this is going to be like Supergirl but it's Conan the Barbarian or uh, you know some kind of fantasy thing and th this is a blend I think of epic fantasy and, and science fiction uh, yeah, where absolutely. It's not like it's not like Dune or something where it's basically fantasy, but it's within a science fiction setting. Like I think by the by the end of all of this, the, it's got the fantasy trappings as much with with like uh, character arcs as anything. Because again, it does feel like a almost like Greek uh, myth level epic. But it's also straight up science fiction, uh, just in the gallivanting around the universe and all of and all of that, like. I don't mm -hmm. think it's too Star Wars. No, it's almost like a blending of Star Wars and Star Trek in that you get some of the harder sci-fi that you don't typically get in Star Wars, but then you also have more of that kind of fantasy adventure uh, that you get from Star Wars. Um, okay, I got to ask you, uh, as we're getting into all of this, what was... Because I, I like the way these issues... I. Uh, I don't want to say standalone, but how we really do have chapters of a novel here, and they don't just you know mm. each blend into each other. I uh, I'm fine with this being made into a movie. I or I also think it could have been a TV show. What is I? Uh, what was your favorite issue? Ooh, that's really hard because uh, it was very consistent. Uh, what would be my favorite issue? Um. I think it's probably either the issue where they're on the planet with the green sun or maybe the planet where they deal with uh, the blue and purple people, maybe. I don't know. I just off the top of my head, I, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, for me, for me, it's a toss up between the uh, the green sun, uh, which is which is wonderful. I think I think that technically is my favorite issue, but I'm also really partial to the way he handles the destruction of Krypton in Argo City and all of that. And oh yeah, that no, flashback is there. killer, and we're gonna have to talk about that. No, that's definitely up there. No, I didn't really thought of uh, you know where kind of each issue ranks within it, but. Uh... That's interesting. It's probably either of those two. I guess three, because I also agree with you on that flashback. Uh, I love stuff like this because this reads great in one or two sittings, but I also kind of wish I was reading this month to month when it came out. No, and uh, Tom King still writes it, like, issue to issue. Like, obviously, he knows what's going on, but, like, you can read an issue and, you know, get something out of it. There's uh, a couple really of things refreshing. that he's doing in the last issue, and one one of my biggest reservations about this just is the ending. I feel like there's some there's some rushing happening, and I don't totally know what to make of the last couple pages. We'll also have to talk about that. But I I do feel like you, you, when when you say he knows where everything's going, I think overall that's true. I do feel like there's a couple choices in that last issue that might be kind of retroactive. I if, I I could not decide if I fully bought her I uh, the the big kind of twist at the end where Supergirl says uh oh crypto was actually fine the whole time oh so when that happened because at the beginning of the story like I said um crypto gets shot with an arrow and uh uh part of the reason why Supergirl goes on this adventure is that 
um, the vet tells her that Crypto's going to die because uh, he was poisoned, and they don't know what poison uh, was on the arrow, so they need the actual guy uh, to give it to them so they can uh, help Crypto. And when you get to that twist when Supergirl says, oh, Crypto is fine the whole time, my immediate thought was, oh, that's pretty cheap. And then, I don't know, it won me over in just the kind of little speech that she gets where um, uh, Supergirl kind of wanted to take her along because she needed her to learn this lesson about revenge and that if she just went off on her own, that girl was going to follow her anyways. And uh, I don't know, I think it ended up working for me ultimately. Yeah, it's a good speech. The problem is, in the moment, it reads too much like Crypto getting hurt is Supergirl's main motivation for going. Well, then, uh, that's the other thing, too, uh, that I that I didn't mind it I for. I don't know if, if on a second read. I, I went back and looked over that, that space again, and I still wasn't totally sure that it gelled. Um, but maybe the idea is supposed to be that it has less to do with her, with her also kind of wanting revenge on this guy, uh, and, like, because the idea is she does relate to Ruth ultimately in her, uh, sense of vengeance, even though she has the speech about justice versus vengeance, uh, not just because of what happens to Crypto, but because there is some sense of regret with her that she was never able to do anything to avenge her family on Krypton, uh, and and I and I like that stuff a lot. So like maybe that's all it is, but it's just in in that moment I kind of I don't know. I'm talking myself out of this argument now. Like maybe <laughs> may, maybe it does work okay, but 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 I, I don't know. As I was reading it, I was just sort of like, it it did read like an afterthought. It did read like all the way up to this point. Maybe Tom King thought that they actually did need to find this guy. Uh, because here's the question: Why is if she doesn't actually need the guy for the antidote, why is Supergirl after him except to help this girl not try to take revenge on him and kill him? You know what I mean? Like, she goes through... She just met this girl. She goes through all of this... These insane trials and tribul tribulations for for this girl that she just met. Is that all it is? Is it just to teach her that lesson? Uh, so I think it's a mixture of if Supergirl doesn't go uh, with Ruth, then Ruth's just going to go off on her own and she's going to get herself killed. And also, um, like after he attacked her, I think there is an element of that too. Yeah, I just I, you see what I'm saying though. You, like, yeah, why I'm not a hundred percent sure about it. Well, and the other thing that I had because she has that sorry, she has that line where she says, "I needed you to come with me because you knew what he looked like." And um, that that suggests because I don't think she's lying when she says that. That suggests that she's not motivated simply by helping Ruth learn a lesson and not be a murderer. Well, I think she is lying about uh, not remembering what he looked like, because um, there is a part later on where she looks at the video and goes like, "Yeah, it was him," and she doesn't have Ruth with her. And uh, she has that line when she reveals the thing with the dog, where she's like. Come on, like, you didn't think I could do this all on my own? I'm Supergirl. Oh, that's a good uh, point. So she might be sort of manipulating her at that point also. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we should mention this aspect of the book. There's also the very pesky, unreliable narrator through this whole thing. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Uh, because uh, you have Ruth uh, telling the story decades later as an old woman. And she even tells you in various places, uh, I'm not telling you everything that's happened. And I'm skipping certain parts because, and I like this a lot. There's some parts she says she skips because they're boring. Like, like I, I like I like the way the book uh, deals with how hard uh, relatively, like, Superman and Supergirl stories are to tell. Uh, it's, it's kind of fun that we have a bit of a meta-commentary on the... Uh, like like on the narrative of of these kinds of things where it's like well you've got a character with a lot of superpowers that's invulnerable so certain things certain places there's no stakes so it's not that interesting so i'm just gonna skip that part because you know supergirl's gonna win i liked that and then there's places that she skips because she doesn't want to relive them because they're too traumatic and that's really good too yeah that was something that i thought he did better here than with uh some of the stuff in his batman 
like um, War of Jokes and Riddles is very scattershot, where it's just kind of, like it feels more like he's hitting bulletin points uh, than like actually telling a story from start to finish. Um, or bullet points, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. But here, like, it's got that kind of feel, but it still has like a through line and it connects and it doesn't feel as much like I'm not really getting anything out of it. Uh, where, you know, with that uh, Batman story, like, it almost felt like an event where like, I'm just getting key important points and nothing in the middle. And here I'm at least getting stuff in the middle. So it helps flesh it out more. Uh, John Ty in the comments says the narration from uh, Ruthie or Ruth I, uh, I'm not sure how her name, her, her real name is pronounced, uh, is from her book. Uh, well, yes, but you have that that uh, that bit toward the end where uh, they're they're uh, they're in the future and she and Supergirl are talking about how uh, what she wrote is not uh, exactly what happened. And it's pretty clear even before that that you have a lot of unreliable narrator. Yeah, no, exactly. No, there's a line where she says something about how her book is ultimately a work of fiction. Yes, that's what it was. She's like, she she even I uh, uses the word fictitious. Um, and so, and I'm not criticizing it for doing that, except to say there are places where it's a it might be a little bit of a crutch, where it might be a little bit easy to say, uh, well, it doesn't really matter if this shakes out because who knows what really happened anyway. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But usually, yeah. I think he's using unreliable narrator to uh, a really effective, um, in a really effective way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and the way that we jump around, like you said, with the whole, you know, I'm not going to tell you everything part, uh, a lot of it is just to, because uh, this book takes place over several months. Yeah. So it just kind of fills in some of that gap where it's like, yeah, you know, there was like a month went by, nothing really happened. Anyways, moving on. Uh, but that's part of uh, why I was, I was okay with the crypto thing was the whole book I was going, okay, but they've been at this for months. Like, wouldn't crypto be dead? Yeah. <laughs> he was poisoned. Well, I thought he was dead in the first place. I, I had that too. It seems like he's dead. And then later on, they talk about him as still being alive. And I was kind of confused by that. And then ultimately it was just a matter of, Oh, well, Supergirl wasn't entirely truthful about what was going on with that. So, yeah. And I guess that makes sense because he's kind of taken out and, because he's there at the beginning, I, I found myself going, oh, cool, it's like a Supergirl and Crypto book, and then I guess I was a little disappointed that he's not there through through most of it, and I wondered if bringing in the horse was Tom King's way of going, uh, yeah, for people that think it's cool that I'm using Super Pets, we'll bookend it with Super Pets. Uh, <laughs> what did I miss? Where did the horse come from? It's out of nowhere, the horse is there. Yeah, no, he, he just shows up. Uh, <laughs> I guess just at some point... Um... <laughs> from going from the uh, green sun planet to fighting him again. Uh, we got rid of him. Uh, I, I'm calling it now. That is the first thing we cut in the movie, I think, is uh, a comet. That or there's more of an explanation for why he's there. I think the most likely, and I'm wrong all the time, so who knows. I think the most likely thing they'll do is find an excuse to keep crypto through more of it. Or, or... just... Re- have crypto come back for that point. have him come back at the end yeah mm-hmm. i could see that too. because the horse really does come out of nowhere and and the problem with trying to use the horse in the movie is the same problem that you have with it in the book which is it's really the only thing that kind of feels like i'm lost if i haven't looked at any other material because there's kind of a throwaway explanation about how uh the horse is really a person uh which I um rang some bells, but I don't remember much about. I uh, but they, yeah. So I had to ask our buddy Josh that knows about Superman stuff. About yeah, about that. And apparently, that is a thing. Uh, that I thought it was, was. He was a guy that was in love with Supergirl, and then he became a horse. Yeah. Uh, comics are weird. I don't know. 
<laughs> and don't get me wrong, I do appreciate that we're not uh, taking a long time to hold the audience's hand with that kind of thing and do, you know, pages and pages of recap. Uh, and But I think a lot of other mythology and history that is here, I mean, there's not a ton of it, but what's here, uh, I think, is handled a little bit more gracefully than that is, mostly just because that, that character comes out, of, again, comes out of nowhere. Uh, it's, it's so random that it's there in the first place. I think the only thing you really need to see in scene is the Argo stuff. And I'm kind of surprised I'm saying that because um, I don't, I, I don't need everything to be, like, somebody's first time reading a character, but this is such a good, uh, like, like introduction and uh, argument for Supergirl is not just girl Superman, that I found myself wanting to be able to hand this to a person that had never read Kara before, and I... If you if you do that, if this if this is going to be a good uh, you know all by itself encapsulation of that character, yeah, you're going to need a little bit of flashback with with Krypton. So I'm I'm glad it was ultimately there because I didn't think we were going to do any origin stuff, mm -hmm. but also because yeah, it did bring some new stuff to the table. Yeah, no, everything about that uh, was really cool. And uh, talking about just kind of throwing in comic book stuff and just accepting it, I really like because. Uh, uh, Comet the Super Horse ends up dying, and uh, Supergirl comes back with his body, who's just you know a human. And Ruth's like, you know, who the heck is that? And I really like. Yeah, Supergirl that's the part where I'm taking out a little bit, where I'm like, oh, he's, he's a, it's a dude draped in a cape. And like, what is well, happening? I, I really like Supergirl's line where she goes, "Yeah, it's Comet. He was a person. Uh, he turned into a horse. Look, like, it doesn't matter. Look, I understand what's happening here. Okay, <laughs> that's all that matters." Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I mean. That is that is fun. It's just the one thing that would take out a person that hasn't read Supergirl before, I guess. No, absolutely. No, I was confused for a second, and then I went, okay, I guess he's a person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's ultimately kind of great because it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, my favorite thing about the Krypton stuff is the uh, – and I don't remember ever reading this anywhere else, Austin. So I don't want to give Tom King too much credit if somebody else has suggested this before. I thought it was nothing short of chilling to say Krypton does not explode in a day. Mm -hmm. Like, I love that. Like, well, that's it, typically it takes how a, we see it. It takes a lot of time. People are More people die of, or actually not more people, but uh, a bunch of people end up dying of, uh, of radiation poisoning. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, all after so you have you have very few survivors, and then most of the ones that do survive only last so long, and because of kryptonite poisoning, and then they're able to build a lead shield that saves them for a while, and then that fails after there's like a meteor storm, and then most everybody else dies after that, and finally Kara's father just throws his hands in the air and builds a, a Clark-like spaceship and sends her off. Yeah, I almost wonder uh, if that's never shown up in anything, if that was just – because this book comes out in, I think, 2021. Um, and I wonder if that's maybe Tom King writing to what he knows and kind of making that sort of like a pandemic thing. Oh, interesting. I didn't I didn't even think of that. Yeah, yeah, I just thought of that in the moment while you were talking about it. I, like if that doesn't show up anywhere, I don't know. Uh, oh, sorry. I think I went too far. I was I was gonna try to look at some of that Krypton stuff, and I'm stuck on dinosaurs. I think part of the reason I love this issue is because uh, we, we get we get to see Ruth fight dinosaurs. I love, yeah. by the way, that she becomes like a full fledged warrior before she meets up with the man she wants revenge on and is trying to decide if she is going to actually go through with it or not. Because uh, in the first issue, she is not capable enough to do that, and by the time she's taken down dinosaurs, she's got a shot. Mm -hmm. And her yeah, strategy exactly. for for how to for for how to take him down is uh, really believable. That whole thing was great. Mm -hmm. Like she puts the sword in between them, and then they both yeah, you get the standoff. They both rush at, at each other, but then she's got the quote unquote high ground uh, because she's she's got a plan to like you know get sand in his face first and. Mm -hmm. You know, like she yeah, lures exactly. him into a trap and all of that, but but still does it in in the first place to be more honorable about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, no, their fight's really cool, and 
I can't. You know, find it starts on stuff. That western. It? Oh, plays. it's in here. There we go. I went. I went past all of it. <laughs> and then it becomes like a downy Sherlock Holmes thing where she's breaking down her plan. <laughs> John Ty uh, put in a $5 super chat. Thanks, man. Uh, he knows this book really well, it seems like. He says, King is using the Golden Age Supergirl origin in this book. Uh, and I thought that was the basis for, uh, especially with her being in the spaceship again, like Clark and all of that. Uh, but I I thought some of this was maybe a little new in just, like, how how much bleaker it is than it is in some other things. Because usually everybody in Krypton dies instantaneously, and then you have the ones that make it on Argo City and the ones that make it in uh, the Bottle City of Candor, and they're just fine until yeah. <laughs> they're not. Yeah, I assumed it was a mixture of uh, what we've done before and some new ideas. Um, but I've never read solo Supergirl, so I just always assumed Supergirl's origin was just... Oh, by the way, uh, Superman's costume was also shot off on a <laughs> rocket uh, just uh, down the road. I <laughs> uh, did, did you and and like this this is minor, and I don't mean to get uh, you know too bogged down with uh, with details, but <laughs> did you buy that uh, like, like there is a little bit of a conceit that you have to have if you're doing this version of the origin right, where it's like. Do we buy that her husband, or a husband, pardon me, that her father was able to just glean enough about the technology from Jarrell to build a spaceship? Uh, I mean, that that is pretty silly, but... Uh, Did you notice that? Where like, yeah. Well, I paid attention! I got the Cliff's Notes version! I can make a spaceship! Well, what I like about it is that it gives the sense that uh, Jarrell was like, hey... Our plant's going to explode. Here's a rocket I made. And uh, he was like, yeah, okay, whatever, loser. <laughs> and then walked away. And then <laughs> at this point, he goes, oh, my God, I have to do that, too. Uh, it's a good thing I remember that he showed me this. And then he basically comes right out and says, boy, I'm glad I was paying attention, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I don't know. That was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I thought that was funny, too. And, and I... I I still have that thing uh, that a lot of people have just with Jarrell and Laura in the first place, where we always have to come up with some kind of excuse to not put everybody, like, just build the rocket a little bit bigger, where it's got a couple more spots in it. And I've seen that explained really well before, and I've seen it, uh, you know, kind of glossed over. Um, it's a little glossed over here. There's not a, that good of a reason that he couldn't have just built a slightly bigger rocket. Well, I was really hoping we were going to get crypto here and he was going to go, okay, like you're in the ship. Well, also I'm putting crypto in with you. <laughs> uh, he's talking about super pets, which is, uh, which is better left unspoken about, but no, I, I genuinely, I was hoping that we would have crypto there. I thought, I thought that's where they were going to go. Cause crypto is at the start, but I guess it's probably more so crypto's original origin. Uh, there's, I really, I really thought you were just talking about super pets. But, oh no, that that does happen there. Because that happens in super pets. But there's, uh, there's really no explanation for why crypto is there, uh, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But like, we don't actually yeah, get his just, origin. You wouldn't yeah. know just reading this if he's even really Kryptonian. <laughs> no, he is. Mean, he uh, must be. But he and Comet just kind of show up. It's like, yeah, you, you guys know. He John, doesn't really hold your hand with either. John Ty, I was going to ask you actually what you meant by that when you when when you said it in a comment earlier, because uh, he said, did you see the Peter David Supergirl reference with Supergirl fighting the space dragon scene? You mentioned that uh, in the community tab, and I was looking for it, uh, flipping back through this, and I, even with that, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. I thought uh, what you meant was uh, that just the kind of fiery wings were maybe a reference to his Linda Danvers because she's a she's an angel for like fifty issues of that book. Oh, okay, yeah, she turns into the phoenix in one issue. Yeah, uh, that was pretty crazy. So may maybe that was also a reference. I don't know what you're talking about with the dragon though. Well, because that... I don't know enough about that that version. Yeah, because she fights a dragon there, but I've never read Peter Peter David's run, so yeah. I don't know. Like maybe he she also fights that uh, like space dragon thing in that run. Senior Sticks, two dollars super chat. Uh, we got a Super Pets movie. How long till live action? Uh, well, I'm with Austin. I think we'll see Crypto in in this. Uh, I don't know that you'll ever see a full fledged live action Super Pets movie. Like, let's put, 
you know, Ace the Bat Hound and all that stuff together. But I'm hoping that tonally, Austin, uh, all of their movies will uh, be heightened enough that you can also buy Ace the Bat Hound. Like, I would like to see that, if not in Brave and the Bold, a sequel to that. Uh, no, so Super Pets will be the movie after Swamp Thing. It'll be their sixth movie. Uh, <laughs> but, no, I, I hope that uh, Ace the Bad Hound shows up somewhere. That'd be pretty cool. Oh, you mean it's part of the slate they haven't announced yet? <laughs> yeah, it'll be their sixth <laughs> movie. <laughs> uh, so, like I said, I... One of one of my big takeaways, because when when this was announced as a movie, my big reservation was, ah, I really want them to do something as close to New Fifty Two Supergirl as is possible, because that's uh, my favorite version. And I Gunn was was talking about how I uh, this is a real conflicted version because she actually saw the planet Krypton explode uh, as opposed to Superman and, and, you know, wasn't raised by the Kents and all of that. So I was like, okay, there's hope. Like, it sounds like that's kind of the version. And like I said, I really like how this is just that character kind of more grown up, which is why it's a little bit weird seeing her turn 21 at the beginning. I'm like, wow, she got really mature really quickly. <laughs> like, I don't know how old she's supposed to be at the beginning. Maybe she's like 16 or 17 and now she's 21, but I'm like, wow, that she is a grown up 21, man. Like, <laughs> She's going on 40 right now. <laughs> yeah, when Gunn said that, too, like, I saw some people saying, like, oh, you know, they're going to make her dark and jaded. Like, I don't I don't want that. For That's Super just because they don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. But I think this book does such a good job of balancing that. Like, there's so many just, like, sweet moments that you can imagine, like, even Superman being in. Uh, and a lot of small moments, like the part where she teaches Ruth how to wash her hands. Yeah. Which is a really obvious kind of symbolism moment, but mm. but yes, it's it's a, it's a good tender moment. Well, and I gotta tell you, um, like, call me sappy, but where where the book I uh, immediately got me on board because, like I said, I was I was trying to feel out genre and stuff at the beginning, and I couldn't tell if this was was gonna be, um. I you know too much not my thing or not and then obviously I'd warm up to it if it was really good but like I'm I'm not a big like sword and sorcery, sorcery fantasy guy and I thought that's kind of what it was what, what it was turning into at the beginning and I was like oh, okay I got I got strap in for for uh, for for a fantasy book and then uh, you get that moment where which is almost typical for a second and then uh, Tom King uh, turns it on its head beautifully where he's got I. Uh, He's got Ruth uh, trying to explain to Supergirl why her uh, vengeance, her sense of vengeance is so important to her. And Supergirl uh, does the typical, like, I understand speech. And Ruth is like, uh, no, you don't. Uh, how dare you? And she has that great line where she says, I lost my world. And Supergirl just kind of drops everything and really you know almost loses it i bet this reads better on a second read um because she's she says and doesn't even explain yet what she's talking about and just says you know i came here so i didn't have to think about all that you yeah. know like like i like i lost my actual planet you have no idea what you're talking about and how we're the same but i'm like a hundred times you and i almost teared up at that man like i thought that was some powerful writing no i had that even just when it cut when she uh you know, says, you don't understand, uh, I lost my world. And you just have that shot of Supergirl with, like, tears in her eyes. I yeah. was like, oh, man, that, that's really powerful. Yeah, it, it's excellent. And it's not, it's it's not uh, sappy, it's not, uh, like, whiny or anything. Like, it's, no, it's, it's earned there, even though we just met this character a few pages ago. Uh, and that's why I, a few issues later when, and this is just a really good friendship, right? Like, yeah. it's a really believable, naturally forming relationship between these two people, and you buy them as lifelong friends by the end. Um, and I like the choice, by the way, to tell the story uh, in hindsight like we do, and we don't need any kind of explanation about what the rest of the DC Universe looks like decades later. Like, who cares? Uh, it's, it's one of those cool stories that can be in continuity, but fits fine as its own thing if it isn't. Uh, kind of like a killing joke. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like I guess that's what the black label's for. Um, well, and this isn't black label. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure it is. I uh, I haven't 
I, I didn't see anything on covers or anything that said black label. It had it it had a different um not label, but hold on, I I gotta here, scroll all the way back here, guys. Look. Pardon me. <laughs> Let me see. I'll pull it up because I was pretty sure it was black label. Oh, maybe not. Well, and it's thirteen plus. Like it's it's not it's not even a mature book. Yeah, no, I don't I don't see it on they, there. They okay, were calling never mind. it something. Sorry, guys, this is gonna drive everybody insane. Well, I'm trying to roll back here. Yeah, no, it looks like I was wrong about it. I don't have another screen to jump to. Well, I'm trying to remember what they were calling that because uh, there was a thing they were calling it. But anyway, uh, the point I was going to make real quick is uh, you've got that point later where uh, Ruth is making a big deal out of how much Supergirl has to hold back and uh, how she's, you know, got a lot of rage, but she's all about, uh, like, keeping that in check. Uh, infinite Frontier. I don't know what that means. Oh, weird. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what that is either. Yeah, I don't know why I just assumed it was Black Label, but... Um, I don't know. It's, we seem to just slap that on a ton of stuff, even retroactively, so... <laughs> well, and it would be uh, really cool to get this in that pristine format size, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, the reason I was I was mentioning that real quick was was just to say that I uh, you've you've got that moment we were we were talking about at the beginning that real kind of tear jerky kind of kind of scene, and when I and I feel like it's a really good payoff to that or really consistent with that uh, when she's talking about restraint later. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, no, I thought I thought all of that worked. Um... That uh, was Supergirl's character and kind of how they both uh, go off on this together and uh, it's until really, the end. <laughs> it's really compelling to see. Yeah, let's talk about that in a second. It's really compelling yeah. to see. Pardon me. Um, did I just cough into the mic? Uh, no, I didn't hear anything because the sound cut out and I was like, oh, oh, did we freeze? Okay, no, you just muted yourself. No, I muted myself and then I tried to unmute it and then it wasn't unmuting. So then I was like, oh, no, did I cough into the microphone? <laughs> so um, it's really compelling and and it's and it kind of it kind of bothers me a little bit, Austin, because I'm going to go as far as to say that Tom King makes a really good argument here for Supergirl being an easier character to write and make more compelling than Superman. And yeah, I'm not saying that suddenly after reading this, now I care more about Supergirl than Superman and we should just forget about Superman and just tell Supergirl stories. I'm not saying that, but I seeing a character who went through what she did in the past and then goes through all the insanity she goes through in this, because, I mean, it's a gauntlet, man. Tom King is not afraid of killing his darlings, man. <laughs> and I, she is trying to uphold the same values that Superman does and seems to be mostly succeeding ultimately, except I don't really know what's going on the last page. And so we'll talk about that. But forgetting that for a second, um, it's very difficult for her, and she really struggles through it. But she's also such a uh, hopeful character at the end of the day that it's uh, it's kind of easier to relate to her uh, more often than uh, maybe it is Superman. And so I feel like I... And again, don't get me wrong. I love Superman, but I uh, I feel like Supergirl is maybe especially this this iteration uh, like something like a New Fifty Two Supergirl or this one, um, it it seems like it would be a really good transition or gateway for people that don't understand what's interesting about Superman as a character as opposed to just uh, a like wish fulfillment like uh, you know masculine fantasy. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I thought it was really fun um, with that because you have like a running joke throughout the book that you know they're going to all these places, and uh, Superman's made enemies everywhere. So people go like, "Oh, you're you're Supergirl. You're Superman's like uh, weaker sidekick or whatever." Like, I, I'm not gonna fight Superman, but I'll take up my vengeance on you. And uh, Supergirl always goes, "Yeah, like I don't know. People really hate my cousin." And then there's the part where they're on they the... They effing hate him. She keeps yeah. saying that. Yeah, she swears a ton. And uh, there's that point where they're on the planet with the kryptonite sun. 
and uh, Supergirl swears, and she's like, you know, uh, Clark wouldn't like hearing me say that. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Maybe I also kind of hate him sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> like I like that she again that she's trying to uphold the same values but she's rough around the edges and can't help it and seems and, and like the best Superman stories you can see how human he is even while he is uh, he's able to put on that face mm-hmm. and this is just Superman yeah. without that face yeah this like, is she leads by example if, uh... but she <laughs> makes it clear the way she talks and it, and uh, the way she carries herself, it's it's not easy. She's more real about it, I guess, is what I'm saying. She's like a Superman that falters and uh, like struggles, but ultimately still embodies that same kind of uh, like hope and feeling. Or at least I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. Do you want to talk about that ending? Yes. Because I'm real confused about it. Now I've jumped all the way to the beginning here. Yes, yeah, so the ending is kind of bizarre. Uh, well, I really like the ending up until we cut to the future. Because um, I, the part where Supergirl... So, I'll set this up for people who haven't read it. Um, yeah, absolutely, thanks. Uh, they get Krem, and uh, Ruth is going to kill him, and then she ultimately can't. But then Supergirl comes down and goes, okay, well, I'm going to do it myself. And uh, we have like and a keeping moment. in mind the whole point. Sorry, the whole the whole reason Supergirl was uh, doing all of this in the first place was to help this girl, or at least part of the reason, as we talked about earlier, was was to help this girl to not be a, a killer. And mm. through her adventure with Ruth, she, she it is it is flipped where she almost wants him more dead than she does, than than Ruth does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's kind of broken her in a way. And, um, you know, Ruth gives her the speech about how she's learned that uh, she couldn't kill him and that's why she couldn't do it herself. And uh, she did, you know, win out and kind of learn what she was, uh, what Supergirl wanted her to learn. And uh, it reminded me a lot of the ending of War of Jokes and Riddles, where they both kind of end in that the hero, like, breaks or, like, possibly breaks thing. Uh, but I thought it worked a lot better here, where like I didn't buy it at all with War of Jokes and Riddles, where Batman kind of snaps and tries to kill the Riddler, uh, but Joker stops him. Uh, but here, I I fully bought that Supergirl had that moment of weakness. Do you know how supremely tired I am of this trope and this theme in general and superhero stuff? After yeah. 14 years of reviewing this stuff, over and over and over again, it feels like, this probably isn't true, it feels like 50% of superhero stories, especially on television, it's probably more like 80, but it feels like 50% of superhero stories are, uh, if you kill somebody, uh, it will you will be like them, and you'll never be able to come back from it, and it, you always have that moment... Even if a character has killed people the whole movie, you always have that moment where uh, they decide at the end to do the right thing finally and not kill the the bad guy somewhat arbitrarily, right? Uh, (laughs) This nails it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Nails it. I, I, yeah. and, and I had that thought while I was reading this scene that we're looking at right here where I, where I was thinking, you know, usually I would... Uh, really resist this and having to read this scene again. Uh, but in in the context of this, I uh, it it felt fresh again. Like I like I totally bought because look at everything she went through. Like I felt horrible for Supergirl this entire book, and also hated this guy she hates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then exactly. how amazing is it when he is sort of redeemed at the end? And I bought that too. Yeah, no, it was very uh, kind of Superman in that way, where uh, he's put into the Phantom Zone, and then a uh, hundred years later he comes out, and Supergirl goes, "Yeah, like he, you know, in uh, the first fifty years he was just how he was before, but in the last fifty years he had like a real change of heart and realized, you know, how bad everything was." And well, and I don't want to quibble with you. It's 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 kind of I. Uh... It's weird because it's actually like 300 years. It's like, oh, is it 300? Yeah, okay. it's like the first 100, 100 years he just kicked and screamed and hollered and wanted out. And then the second 100 years he uh, finally started feeling bad. 
and then the the third hundred years he was uh he started to like really atone and was a model prisoner and uh now supergirl thinks it's okay for him to come out uh now there are questions one of them is is that all time that passes just in the phantom zone or has it actually been literally 300 years on earth and i assumed it had just been 300 years and they're aliens so they live longer and that was my assumption. and supergirl has that i uh, kind of because uh, we because we change this a lot in different stories. Sometimes Superman ages slowly. Sometimes he doesn't seem to age at all. So are we saying Supergirl just doesn't age? I yeah, I think so. And then, but you can age in the Phantom Zone because usually characters don't age in the Phantom Zone. But I guess in this they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess because so. he's an old man now. So like he aged yeah. in the Phantom Zone. Okay. <laughs> And that doesn't seem like the best. Again, I'm I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of quibbling, but this is funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I I guess the Phantom Zone is a really good place to rehabilitate criminals. Yeah, I, I, I had that thought. <laughs> that doesn't seem like the right environment for rehabilitation. <laughs> no, it's just really bad. And eventually, you go, oh man, I need to get uh, rehabilitated. I know I would if I was in, like, a little square thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that they kind of do the the Donner thing. Where, mm-hmm. but, yeah, it's but the little plane of glass. Yeah. Yeah. Except uh, except no. he looks like he's in a coaster. <laughs> What's well, especially funny because the way that he gets out is that she breaks the glass. She just, like, throws it on the ground. <laughs> Senior Stick says Clark and Kara age differently from humans. No, I get that, but usually Superman ages a l- it, it, some anyway. You know, like like you, you go to Kingdom Come and he's got gray hair on the sides. and Here it doesn't seem like she ages at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's one of those stories. And that's fine if age. that's what we're doing, but the bigger question for me was just, I didn't know when we said 300 years if that much time had passed for them, because sometimes time passes differently in the Phantom Zone. Mm-hmm. I just I didn't know what any of the Phantom Zone logic was. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was just actually supposed to be 300 years, and the Phantom Zone ages at the same time as uh, uh, outside of it. It's just is another plane of existence. Uh, but yes, we're nitpicking right now because it's fun. Uh, let's talk about what we're really confused about with the ending, Austin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, you want me to say it? Okay, so... Uh, she lets him out of the Phantom Zone and like I said she goes oh you know he's been uh, rehabilitated and uh, he gets out and he goes Ruth like I'm I'm so sorry for what I did to you and then <laughs> Ruth hits him over the head with a cane and he hits the ground and then they both walk away and it's really awkward <laughs> like I don't know why Supergirl uh, just lets Ruth bash him over the head, and she's just okay with that. Uh, it all, it's also just weird because they make a point that he's rehabilitated. And, like, I get, you know, if somebody did something that bad to you, you'd probably never forgive them. But, like, it, I don't know. It's just, I thought it was just kind of muddled. But the whole point was that I, you had this, this whole scene uh, in the past, of course, where she tried to get her vengeance and couldn't bring herself to do it because of, partly because of the example that she learned from Supergirl, of course, and uh, she she wants to to believe in the kind of optimism that Supergirl upholds, and she herself stopped Supergirl from doing that. Uh, now, that scene also ends somewhat abruptly, and I let me tack this on real quick, and I don't love that, Supergirl's uh, kind of newfound or uh, you know replenished faith, uh, you know optimism, it happens off panel, because uh, because she has this kind of mental breakdown where she she quotes and this is this is another example Austin of what you're talking about earlier with good repetition, uh, this and this is kind of you know standard screenwriting 101 stuff. This is the kind of repetition you expect in a thing where there is a real important major line that sticks with both the audience and another character that that character hangs on to and brings back later in another context. I uh, and 
th- that is uh, the world is too large and we're too small. Uh, Ruth says that earlier in the book, and I, as kind of a justification for I can't be any better than I am. I, I don't I don't have the strength to not try to avenge my father. And Supergirl says that after everything uh, that's that's happened to her, and it has as much to do with Krypton as as, as anything. I think uh, where she's feeling the same way Ruth does, and maybe didn't even realize just how much she felt that way. And she she doesn't kill uh, Krem, but then she breaks down and she says, the world is too big and we're too small, which kind of suggests that she's had a shattering disillusionment. She is like like she's not going to go through with it, but she but she also feels defeated. She's also not sure uh, that she believes in what she believed. And then we just cut to eh, she's fine now. <laughs> mm hmm. Uh, yeah, we kind of just skip past that. It feels like, uh, we kind of hit a point where we go, okay, uh, yeah, I only have so much, um, page space left. I need to kind of get through some of this a little bit faster. That's what it reads like. Yeah. Uh, Philip Kelton says rehabilitation doesn't mean you, uh, people forgive you, clockwork orange anyone. Yeah, but she doesn't have to forgive him to not hit him over the head. Like, like I, I'm just, I'm not sure what the last page, what the point is being made here. When 300 years earlier, she didn't have to get her vengeance on this guy. She learned that lesson. She got past it. Maybe she doesn't actually literally forgive him, but she's, I, uh, she's gonna get past that. And then what was shocking to me about it, Austin, is the whole point. The page before this seems to be, um. Luckily, I didn't lose myself in that moment because Supergirl's perspective, because I was right. Even this guy could be redeemed. Even this guy could be saved. And then they let him out of the Phantom Zone and almost as if she expects him to do it or sorry, expects Ruth to do it. um, She picks up her cane and smashes him in the head. Now, I don't know if he's just knocked out unconscious. I don't know if he's dead. There's a big sport of blood that comes out. If he is just unconscious, don't do this in silhouette. But, like, what is the point of this last page? It's almost like just shock for the sake of shock, it feels like. Um, Like, I almost have to ignore it to appreciate the rest of the book. And I feel like I must be missing something. Yeah, well, and I just, I feel like the natural thing to do there is she goes, she goes to hit him and then Supergirl stops her and says something about how, um, you know, like he's suffered enough or something, you know, like something along that line. I don't, I don't know. I could see like the typical, you know, punch him in the face and walk away, you know, that kind of thing. This looks really brutal in silhouette and (laughs) Like, I don't mean to make too big of a deal out of it if Tom King, like, didn't mean the guy to be dead, but you got to make it clear in your in your narrative what you're doing. It's the last thing I'm left with. And it reads just weirdly, um, like, cynical at at the end of this very optimistic, hopeful kind of book. Like, that's not what this book was doing. Well, for me, it just felt like we want the uh, opening and the ending to be the same. Uh, to parallel in that way of having somebody being struck down. Yeah, but I just I didn't think it really worked. Uh, yeah, well, John and I didn't ca- I didn't catch that. John Ty says uh, Krim isn't dead. The last page is to parallel the first page. Okay, but can, can you be sure though? And and even if not, it just seems like a weird thing to leave us with. Mm-hmm. Um, I also don't yeah. get why in the unreliable. Uh, narrative in her uh, in her book, she seems to be throwing Supergirl under the bus. I uh, where where it seems am I reading this wrong? Where it seems like in the book she's telling the reader in the in the fiction after after by the way telling the reader about all the optimistic stuff at the end uh, that it's good that this guy is 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 a better man now uh, that. Supergirl ran him through with a sword. Yeah, and in, in her book, well, it says at the beginning of of it too that uh, okay, there's a line about how she started to kill him, and then Supergirl was the one who kind of finally drove it in and finished him off. Uh, uh, yeah. 
Instead, she moved her sword swiftly through the air and stabbed down and through the chest of the kneeling brigand. Yeah, so in her book, Supergirl did kill Crab, and I don't have a read on that yet. It's... I don't know. <laughs> Phil Kelton says he's holding his head. Dead people don't hold their head in pain. Well, yeah, like... he. No, and I never it thought in... he was dead, well, but I... I still I did it first. With... I mean, he's not holding it in the last panel. Like he could he could be dead, but it doesn't really matter if he is or not. The Yeah, the, I still have an issue with it. The it's, narration it's, is it's weird. Like Supergirl. I, I think don't get Supergirl why in the book character. she's saying Supergirl killed him. I mm-hmm. uh, that that's one of the weird things about it. And also I just personally don't think this is the way to end this book off. Like mm-hmm. I hope the movie doesn't end like this. <laughs> I'm sure it'll play it yeah. as like like more of a comedic kind of thing, but it doesn't it doesn't land with this is a good man now. Like I get her maybe just turning around and walking away and won't say anything to him. Well, and and that's my thing is my main issue with with it is Supergirl. I think Supergirl feels out of character that she would just stand there and let this happen and then walk away because yeah. she. It's like, oh, you know, like I, you know, it really shows you that anyone can change. Like it, it was this big thing for me. Obviously, Ruth, like I said, if somebody did something this bad to you, you would probably never forgive them. Uh, so it's fine. Yeah. But like, it's, I think we're on Supergirl's perspective. And I have this with Tom King where I've not, I've never read a Tom King book where there isn't at least one moment where characters feel out of character. And I made it the entire book and I was like, oh my god, this is going to be the first place where it doesn't happen. And then it's the very last scene. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so like that that was the biggest thing that I resisted. Uh, it doesn't kill the whole book. But I, but I do kind of feel Absolutely. like I'm missing something. I, I don't, I don't get why exactly he felt the need to end it like that. And it, and like I said, I, there's some rush stuff in general toward the end, and it just kind of feels like he wasn't. And I feel like I've had this with with uh, with this writer before. It's it, it seems like he needs some kind of punchy ending, and he's just not really sure how to end it. Yeah, no, like I said, it it feels very much like he wants the beginning and the end uh, to match, but I just, I don't think it should. Yeah, well, and I'm not going to give uh, a story a pass on, well, it did it artistically. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Book in for the sake yeah. of book in. Because at that point, you can just say, well, if you, if you uh, pick a formula and you stick to it, then you did it correctly. Uh, it's all about whether it's, it's effective and working on me as I'm reading it. And I was very confused by that last page. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, no, I thought the entire book Even if ultimately it makes sense, that... it took me out real hard at first, and it, I, I, I reread that page seven times trying to figure it out. <laughs> so, like, something is lost on me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I thought the whole book was wonderful, and then the it's really just, like, the last page. I was like, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it, I don't know, it doesn't really kill the book for me. It just... It ends on a wonky page. No, and that is a testament to how good the book he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, Absolutely. That, that doesn't ruin it. Um, it it helps if, if we can be sure. And he's probably not. It helps if he's not dead, I guess. But it's still really odd. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe you're right. Maybe it'll just be like a, a joke in the movie. I don't know. <laughs> I kind of hope they don't do that. I yeah, also... Uh, I also could see them losing the framing device entirely. Well, and uh, that's the thing, too, is we probably won't cut to 300 years later in the movie. Yeah, I doubt they'll do that. Mm. Uh, John Ty, $5 super chat. Uh, in Ruth's book, Supergirl had to kill Krem so that Krem's pirate friends wouldn't go after Ruth so they can go after Supergirl instead. I guess the problem is I didn't understand that her book was a fiction until she says it in the last two pages. And so I wasn't really following the fiction, the the like, uh, the like story of the fiction versus the actual story that's really happening. Well, uh, and they because... knew Supergirl took him, and they fought Supergirl. Wouldn't they go after her anyways? Why would they be like, "Hey, let's read this book that explains what happened"? 
and they would go after her right away. Like it would take her time to write the book. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I would need to, to give it a second read to pick up on all of that because I, I knew there was some kind of nonlinear happening at the beginning. I And by the way, a lot of those typical tropes in comics that I don't like, I, when Tom King is using them in this book, he is finding really good I, I, excuses for them. So like, you know, starting with the inmate express and then going backwards thing that I'm always complaining about worked fine in this, I thought. Mm-hmm. But I need yeah, to give it a second read to fully understand what he was doing with it. Yeah. No, and uh, there's like a ton of stuff. I imagine it's better on a second reading. And it was really good on a first reading, so that says a lot. Uh, but I, I think it's a perfect thing to adapt. I'm really glad they're doing that. And it makes me wish – well, it makes me wish a couple things, Austin. Uh, it makes me want to see uh, like more standalone stuff like this. I uh, like whether it's it's in the DCU continuity or uh or else worlds uh with some of the more recent things that I've actually looked at and, and liked like Harleen like I think Harleen would make a great movie uh but it also makes me want DC to make nothing but these like in in print like the comics yeah. Uh, yeah. I want them to almost give up on monthly comics <laughs> or, or give up on not, not necessarily monthly. These things can come out monthly, but I like, like big long runs with fill in issues. I, uh, that, that are, that are all tying into events anyway. Uh, and, and I've said things to this effect before, but like the only things that are coming out, especially from DC that I'm finding, I have any interest in at all is this kind of thing. And I think this is one of the only kind of the only thing in comics you can't oversaturate. I think you'd have an embarrassment of riches if this is all you were doing. We're a real loose continuity where maybe a lot of this stuff does technically count. You can call back to it if you want to. You can do sequels to it. They can cross some. You could do a bunch of out of continuity things like uh, b- like Batman White Knight or whatever, and uh, just just make uh, you know graphic novels and uh, mini and maxi series. And I think it would save comics right now. Uh, yeah, possibly. I mean, I've always read trades, so that's basically how I've always read comics. So, yeah. We'll yeah, but you'd it. have so much less of your time wasted. Because you wouldn't have to read 19 volumes of things, and then you've got... Because if you're only reading trade, you have to have had this experience, Austin, where you read the first trade of a thing, and it seems really cool, and you want to keep going with it. And then uh, it crosses into some kind of event for the next three trades, and you're like, you know what, I'm out. <laughs> I mean, uh, so many of my favorite runs have that, so it's like, uh, whatever, you know, um, like Guardians with the Abnon Landing stuff, that has like six tie-ins, and it's like a 25-issue run. But uh, what I'm saying is, you, you and I are, I, I are used to this kind of thing, uh, we've been reading comics, absolutely. you know, all our lives, we're, um... Uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I can't think of it. Anyway, uh, but like a lot we're of reason. Oh yeah, exactly. I we're roped in. I'm sorry, it's late. Uh, but you're a lot of people that don't read comics maybe would if it wasn't so much of a commitment and if they didn't think they had to know everything that ever happened in a bunch of other books, and if and like the the cost of entry would be lower. I. Uh, but I think overall, I, like, I, don't, I don't know how many more people overall would be reading comics, and we've talked about this a million times on the channel before, but um, I'm finding myself going back to it because all of a sudden we've got a few books because they were announced to be adapted or influencing the new DCU movies that are, like, selling out and are being scalped real hard and stuff, and I and, and I don't mean to jump the gun. I'm not talking about this tomorrow night on the Captain Logan show. I don't mean to jump the gun too hard because... We, we we have to just wait and see. There's no really there's no way to tell how this will really affect the comic industry. Is it possible James Gunn single handedly just saves the comic industry? <laughs> I mean, hopefully. <laughs> you know, we're like all he had to do was actually show panels and covers of the comics he's adapting, and all of a sudden people are buying them. 
Now, they might yeah. not be buying them to read them. They might be trying to put their kids through college, and it might not <laughs> and it might not last past this first round, but it kind of makes you wonder, well, if the guy that's that's uh, heading up all of this is actually talking about the damn comics. Mm-hmm. Maybe people yes, will start so. paying attention to comics again. Because... <laughs> um... And so they might just be made to be adapted after this and just to, uh, but maybe, but that's better than, uh, they're just made to be commercials for the, for the movies, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the big reason, because you don't typically hear this with, say, like the MCU or whatever, like, it's not like, hey, we made Shang-Chi and everyone was going out to buy and read Shang-Chi. Um, I think the big difference is that, when something like the MCU, when they go, okay, here's our slate. It's a guy on a stage with a PowerPoint, like basically in the background of like the big slate. And it's just a guy going, Hey, yeah, we're making a black Panther movie. And then a doctor <laughs> strange movie. Yeah. And you go, Oh, okay, cool. Like those are characters. Oh, they ever showed before were logos. Yeah. And you just get the logo and you go, okay, like I like those characters, whatever. Uh, James Gunn was, I think, really smart how he did it because instead of that, it was very personal. It was just like a shot of of him like this. And it's just like a man talking to you. And he's like so excited to talk about what he's talking about. And both for the projects they're making and the things that they're adapting. Like he's as passionate about both. And I think it's, it like really comes across when he's talking about it. Like I don't know anything about the authority, but I want to read it now because he was like genuinely really excited to be like, Hey, we're making the authority. Like these comics are really cool. Um, same with this book. And, um, what was the other thing from it that I wanted to get? Oh, I'm going to pick up creature commandos in my next paycheck. Like, like I, it made me excited to look at that stuff. And I think a lot of people are having that. Well, in, Here's what's what's funny about it, and we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. But I uh, we because we're not even reviewing this book anymore. But we live in a world, Austin, in a world where everybody now it feels like I uh, blanket statement, but a lot of people uh, spend a lot of their time now trying to figure out every little morsel about uh, a movie before it even gets made, much less before it comes out, right? And a lot of people, because indoctrinated was the word I was trying to think of earlier, uh, not indoctrinated into comics, never think to go actually just look at the source material for, like, hints and clues as to what I, you know, might actually be in the movie. Uh, Sure, they'll go watch... Uh, like comic review YouTube channels that I, uh, you know, tell them about all the Easter eggs and trailers and all of that. But like before a movie even gets started, if you know the specific source material it's based on, but then again, with superheroes, a lot of the time you don't necessarily know what that is. But now with this stuff, you might. What I'm saying is a lot of these people might start getting wise and go, oh, if I read the books, maybe I know something about this movie that I want to know everything I can know about five years before it comes out. Uh, it it could help the industry. <laughs> Finally. Yeah, I, I think they were just really smart about it. Um, you know, and Gunn was like on Twitter being like, hey, check out all these different comics that uh, went into what we're doing. And uh, I think on DC's website, like the, at the top of the website now, they have like, check out the DC Slate comic uh, lineup. Like, yeah. They're making sure that people know like, hey, um, are you excited for these projects? Because these are the books that you need to go out and buy. Well, and again, I don't want to jump the gun because after I got to quit saying that because <laughs> like I'm just seeing it with two ends now in my head. Um, <laughs> jump the gun. Now, when I when this stuff is being announced, it's a big deal because the future is so uncertain. Right. Like the reason that the scalpers are going crazy and people are trying to get their hands on these books is because this is big news right now. The DCEU isn't even over yet. We already know what's coming after that. I I don't know if a second, third, fourth wave is going to necessarily be like this. I uh, mm-hmm. So like like it's it's hard to, to say what happens in the future. But all I know is for mainstream superhero comics. This is one of the only times in history we've seen movies actually affect comic sales. Yeah, Black but Panther we're not was like seeing... a giant phenomenon, and people didn't go out and... People didn't buy like... the book. 
Yeah. But it's so they bought Booster Gold. Yeah, but this is speculative. Like this Absolutely. isn't the movies affecting it. This is news of the movies affecting it. So it's so it is a little different. But like, I uh, this did happen with Watchmen, and and it's kind of the same. It's it's a similar thing. It wasn't because that movie came out. It was because the trailer came out, and then people yeah. went crazy. And and I, uh, you had several printings sell out of that book. So something we're seeing that happen again, but for mainstream superhero, that's unheard of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, for like the Watchmen comparison, because obviously it's a direct adaptation, that makes sense for this with Supergirl, because they're just adapting this book. But stuff like you know Swamp Thing or like Booster Gold or whatever, or even Superman, like most of that wasn't direct adaptation. It's just you know like he threw out a book and was like, this is maybe uh, going to influence like the tone, but it won't necessarily influence the story. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, if these aren't very direct adaptations, then that also could affect whether that happens again in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's I'm not making any point see. other than this is really interesting. No, and it's really nice to see that people are actually going out and buying comics. Yeah, yeah. it's it's less cool in that you know that a lot of those people are, like, trying to turn them around for you know, bigger dollar amounts no, I'm, and stuff. I'm like, sure, I'm sure there's a lot true. of scalping happening. You're seeing the same thing happen in comics right now that's happening with video games, just to a lesser extent. Mm-hmm. No, and I'm sure that's true too. But like, if it was just that, like we'd see it for any superhero movie announcement. I think there are genuinely a lot of people who are buying stuff because they're excited. Yeah. But I mean, this didn't happen with Guardians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. You know, I mean, people saw that trailer and were really interested in in those characters, but like they're brand new characters. It's like it didn't even occur to them there were comics in the first place. But let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. If James Gunn had come on the Internet somewhere and had said, uh, we're adapting this story by name, not volume one or whatever, something like this, like, well, and I, but I mean, I guess that doesn't matter either because Swamp Thing is suddenly selling and Booster Gold is suddenly selling, like you said. Um, but if he'd come out and said, Abnett Landing Guardians, that's, that, that's, that's what we're adapting, this specific story, would those have flown off the shelves? And yes, there's probably an interview somewhere where he's talking about Abnett Landing, but I'm saying if he'd had like a big announcement like this and was showing Comic Art, if Marvel was as like loving for their comic side as uh, Gunn was for this DC announcement, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, real Nick quick, Schwinder. we've mm-hmm. got uh, one more super chat, so let's go ahead and tackle that. And I'm glad he yeah. said this because we honestly, and I feel remiss in this, we didn't talk about the art at all. Uh, John oh, Ty yeah. put in a five dollar super chat and says, "In your opinion, how great is the art and coloring in this book?" Uh, clearly, that's a leading question. He, how how great is it? Uh, I, I I think it's I think it's quite good. Um, yeah, I, I, did too. I had. I had no complaints about the art uh, whatsoever. I like the kind of and, and he's right about the coloring in particular. Um, I like the uh, kind of pseudo watercolor aspect of it. Uh, and there's a lot of kind of variety in the art. Like it's really consistent, uh, but it works really well for terrestrial and space stuff. No, and it's like a more cartoony uh, look, but it looks it looks really with, nice with the character models. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, with the character models. Yeah, I don't I don't have a problem with how cartoony it is. No, no, I thought it, I thought it looked really good, and like I said, some of the uh, colors when we get into different planets and stuff reminded me a lot of Guardians too, with just kind of how vibrant and how much they pop. Yeah, I like all the splashy stuff. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I like that uh, it's it's really imaginative and yet not feeling the need to try to be Jack Kirby again. Like, I'm always uh, talking about, like, big epic space stuff, uh, you know, being Kirby-esque. This isn't, and it's really good. Uh, I feel like... That's no, very different. Honestly, and I, and I can't think of any particular run, Austin, because as you know, I'm not a like I'm not up enough on this character. This was yeah. reminding me of Wonder Woman stuff before anything. Oh, okay, interesting. Why? Uh, what am I thinking of? Is it is it 52? Is it I'm I guess I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know cuz new 52 is the Azarello run, which Yeah, is, so no it's not like, that. Yeah, which is a bit darker. There is something Wonder Woman that this was reminding me of massively and I cannot think of what it is. Mhm. 
Yeah, off the top of my head, I don't know, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's, and I also like that uh, a lot of the art is kind of simple without being simplistic. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's not crazy intricate or anything, but it's got a style on, all its own. No, that's what I meant by it's got like a cartoonier style on uh, the characters, where it's not like especially detailed. Uh, or like super simplistic, but it's, well, it kind of meets in the middle. Well, that's why it's kind of weird that it's being adapted to a live action movie because I imagine if I was reading this, not knowing they were doing that uh, a couple issues in, I would have been thinking, okay, well like DC directed video is going to do this because I could see this translating really well to animation in, in mm-hmm. this very style. All I know is they better cast an actress with a big nose for uh, Supergirl because that's how she's drawn here. <laughs> Uh, John Ty put in another super chat. Let's tackle this real quick. Uh, another five dollars. Thanks, man. Uh, in issue three, y- is that a great example of having social commentary in comics? Well, it's dealing with uh, th- like the most uh, like uh, uh, typical modern issue that we deal with in fiction, which is bigotry and racism. And in the same way, we do it a lot. But I found it. Uh, uh, really disturbing the way it was handled there. Um, I thought mm-hmm. it was quite good. It, it's weird, cause, right? Because it's uh, cause it's the same thing TOS did, except uh, genocide instead of everybody dies. Uh, it's it's the it's the race of uh, like like white on one side, black on on the other side. Uh, uh, with with the with the blue people and the purple people, uh, like it's it's exactly that situation where you have a like it's let that be your last battlefield. It's a, a really arbitrary, uh, like like measure of uh, we're better than you are, so we have to segregate and all of that. Uh, but the the thing I was most impressed with with it narratively, I. Uh, because, like, yeah, it, it reads at first a little bit typical, where it's like, I see this all the time. Uh, but I thought it was, like, this side story that was that, that was almost, like, shoehorned in. We gotta have an issue uh, about genocide. And then our main bad guy is behind it. And I was really yeah, impressed with that. Connected. And you don't expect it going in. Uh, it does feel like, oh, this is, like, the side quest that they're gonna go on in this issue. And then they're kind of never is that like it is one story from start to finish no it's pretty tightly uh, plotted and then those guys keep going to other planets and doing the same kind of thing yeah no and i liked um maybe not creepy creepy is not the right word but like i liked all their interactions with different people uh on the blue side of the planet like when they're talking to the person at the hotel and it's like hey why why does it say are you blue or purple like what's that about it's... That that gave me like um, in the mouth of madness vibes where they go to the hotel. Good uh, call. It's it's unsettling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And everyone's just kind of like, yeah, don't talk about that. Well, what I what I like about it is it's not over the top, uh, where the uh, the blue people just arbitrarily decide to genocide the other part of their race. I uh, like while Supergirl is there or we find out that they did it, you know, like last Tuesday or something. I like that it's this race of uh, th- these evil brigands who are just looking for excuses to slaughter people. Like that's what they like to do on the weekends. Yeah. <laughs> and I th- 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 like this race. They're terrible in that they look down on this lower class of society that they've arbitrarily decided is lower class, but they're only doing this as, like, a last desperate way to save their race. So obviously I'm not saying that what they do is anything like okay, but I like that it's kind of believable. It's not as black or white. Well, I mean, it's still really messed up, but it's... Mm -hmm. No, I just mean like it's not as black or white. Black but I white buy in the it. Sense that, they didn't just all uh, get up in the middle of the night and decide to go set everybody on fire that they don't like. like yeah, it wasn't just like, hey, w- like we're all a bunch of evil jerks. It's, oh my God, we're all going to die. And we're kind of like, and we are jerks and we're going to do this. But like it was either this or everyone dies. Yeah. And I like that it wasn't as black and white in that way. No, this is going to sound really dark when I say it, but and, and it's an obvious allegory, but I appreciate that it is mm. allegory. 
Yeah. It's it's like if an alien invasion happened with with the brigands in the middle of the civil rights movement. I mean, when you th- when you think about that, it's real messed up. Yeah, absolutely. Because like, what what would we have done? I don't even want to think about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I feel dirty even talking about this, but. It- <laughs> But like, but that—that's what it's doing. Yeah. I thought it, I thought it was powerful. I thought it really worked. Uh, and I also like the. Uh, maybe I'm reading too much into this because I tend to do this. But I found myself going, "Oh, everybody's blue, and like nobody's in a good mood, and like then like everybody feels feels sour and wrong about about what they did. Like that's maybe intentional, right?" Yeah, when well, they also live in like, a blue they're... world, and uh, <laughs> their girlfriend's blue, their car's blue. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm saying uh also i i completely forgot i wanted to bring this up too uh with the in because it's in that issue um if these new dc movies get the ha- get to have the one f-bomb in pg-13 uh this movie better have the uh um with a sheriff is like you know i can have you arrested and supergirl goes no you can't but you're walking you're welcome to effing try <laughs> yeah that's pretty away. good like if if you get the one f bomb, that's that's what it is. <laughs> it would be kind of weird though if the Supergirl only had the f bomb one one time because she's got a potty mouth in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, um, and absolutely. I'm not saying that I need her to have that in that movie. I uh, like mm-hmm. she'll probably, I don't know, she'll probably say the things you can get away with in PG thirteen a lot, right? It'll be like PG thirteen swears, like it'll be like kind of like the MCU where they they get like certain words that they can say a ton. She'll just be Raphael from the Ninja yeah. Turtles movie. Um, what what is damn? Is that your husband? I always I always feel the need to bring this up, but I uh, I do I do wish that we wouldn't do the the symbols for swear words. I hate that. I I I do too. <laughs> Uh, but I guess it's like an all readers book, or it's like thirteen or something. You said, cool. uh, yeah, thir- thirteen and up. I would let Jason read this. Yeah, no, there was nothing in it that I think is super objectionable. Um, I, I, you know what though, I do appreciate, and you know, your mileage always varies with how yeah, mature kids are. Um, I do appreciate that they said 13 plus and that they didn't because this doesn't feel like a, a, a full up like mature book but I mean would you see a guy's hand get totally slashed sh- slashed in half in the last on the, that, that is true issue like it's pretty violent in a few places um but, but I for me for me so much of it has to do with word. tone and what the point of the piece is and what the actions and consequences really are and that sort of thing like yeah. I almost want to just take that last page out and then give it to 13 and up. But <laughs> No, I also think that under 13, kids might be bored with some of the stuff like them traveling uh, in the big ship in episode – or episode – issue two, stuff like that. Oh, that reminds me. I'm sorry. We've got to get going. Um, yeah. And I didn't mean for this to go two hours, but in my defense, uh, John Ty wanted us to talk about more things at the end. So thanks, John. Uh, and I had the crazy thing that happened earlier. But – um. But the the other uh, big criticism that I didn't get a chance to lob at this, and I won't go very long about this because uh, it, it, it's, it's a very simple thing to throw out, is just I sometimes I feel like Tom King really likes to listen to himself write. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. You may not have had this. I found myself with, and I get that it's supposed to be a fiction book or whatever, but I found myself uh, having a hard time not skimming some of the narration uh there's there's a few pages where there's just blocks and blocks of text and i find myself looking ahead and going okay how much of this is actually going to be really relevant uh because like my my, you know i'm reading a comic book and the the uh the pages aren't turning the pictures aren't turning and i don't mean to be like a child with a storybook about it but but i'm just saying like Mm -hmm. uh sometimes it seemed a little bit more about him having fun with the like Renaissance era type language he's doing mm-hmm. than anything where I'm like, I don't know. You could have said that in eight words instead of, you know, 27. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't really have that. Um, oh, interesting. That, that's definitely something I've had in his work before where I go, okay, you don't need as much of this as you have. Uh, but I, I didn't really have it here. Okay. 
Uh, there's some like redundant words and things, and I uh, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I I run a writing workshop. I am a prude yeah. about the stuff. Like, <laughs> no, absolutely. You're you're gonna be more likely to pick up on that than I am. So it's hard not to be picky. Mm-hmm. about that kind of thing but anyway uh well we're gonna get going I, I, austin do you have anything else you want to bring up about this i'm sorry um i like the truth justice in the american way joke that that was pretty great that that's my last thing <laughs> i did too uh although i don't i don't love going to uh it's a burden it's a plane and that was uh, weird and, and and uh like like leaping tall buildings and that kind of thing i just because it's like, what are we quoting? Like, I always complain about this, but in the fiction, what are we quoting, though? Truth, justice, in American way, I think you can get away with more because I can see that just being like a like a slogan that people throw out for Superman. But once we get into all of the announce the the, the announcer from the radio show, I'm like, yeah. Well, I just thought that line was funny because it's uh, she's like, yeah, I just turned 21, so I can get drunk. That's the truth, justice, in the American way. <laughs> No, that's pretty good. Well, and and even like it, it was it was clever. I just don't love going to it when when mm. when I no when I had the, that with the the other ones when we did the uh, leap tall building thing. I did I did kind of like when when Ruth said like how, like like uh, how how many times would it take you? <laughs> yeah, that was kind of clever. Mm-hmm. But when no, she was, but when yeah. Supergirl wakes up and sees pterodactyls and she's like it's an effing bird, and then she goes as plain. I was like. Eh. I think it's weird when yeah. the super person does it. I don't know. <laughs> no, it, then it becomes that uh, I think it's Jessica Jones season two. Of, there's a part where she says, "My, uh, it's like my something senses are tingling," and I'm like, "What? What does that mean? What are you in quoting? This universe? In this what universe, you, yeah. what are you talking about? <laughs> like that? Does, what? <laughs> yeah, it's too cutesy. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> kind of thing drives me crazy. I will always complain about it. Anyway. I'm glad you brought that up. Nobody else is, but I am. Uh, Guys, thanks so very much for listening and watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And I will be back again tomorrow night for the Captain Logan Show. Uh, Austin and I will be back on Wednesday for a request on Team America is what we got to watch for that. Uh, Thursday, another Captain Logan Show. And then Friday night into Saturday is the first of 10 epic 24-hour streams on Smallville. Uh, John and I, a new uh, guest host for the channel, and Austin, for part of it, are going to be watching the entire first season of Smallville. I have a lot of plans. We're going to do giveaways. Uh, we're going to do all kinds of uh, really fun, insane things, and I won't be able to keep up with half of it, I'm sure, but uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you like Smallville, or even if you don't, maybe especially if you don't, uh, show up for that stream. Uh, part of, or all of it, if you're as crazy as we are, 10 o'clock Central, that that night, uh, I've been getting props and things for that show, Austin. I'll, I'll show I'll show this real quick. I already got my uh, I already got my kryptonite rock. I got my rock of kryptonite oh, here. Yeah. There it is. It, it doesn't look as cool on camera right now with this lighting as it does in my hand, but I. Uh, but but it but it looks it looks cool. It's a real rock that looks like kryptonite. Anyway, uh, we're we're gonna get going now. Thanks a lot for watching. I was Captain Logan, and this was Austin, the Day Ghost. Uh, the effing ghost, <laughs> as Supergirl would say. <laughs> Bye, everybody.